Two of the greatest partnerships in British history were cemented under the roof of this building. Rolls and Royce and Posh and Bex. Though obviously Rolls didn't know Royce well enough to discover if he liked wearing ladies' underwear. But this Manchester landmark is also a symbol of a less easy relationship. The one between the north and the south of England. The Midland isn't just a hotel. It's two fingers up at London. It's a great big raspberry built in steel and brick. The Midland Hotel looks much the same today as when it was first built. It squats on an entire block of the city. And it's still possible to read the message it conveyed at the beginning of the 20th century. Here I am. Here's how big I am. And I'm in Manchester, not London. Or, to put it more pithily, ta-da and yeah. On the inside, the message has become a bit garbled. In place of Edwardian grandeur, the foyer looks like your average modern business hotel. Is this Kansas, or Abu Dhabi, or Peterborough? It's not immediately obvious that this was once a palm-filled winter garden crawling with tea-bibbing cotton kings. But if you look carefully, there are still signs of their presence to be read. Those tiles up there are just as they would have been before the First World War. Another century-old survivor is the Octagon Court. Written into the fabric of this building is a century of change. Change in hotel fashions, change in Manchester's self-image, and change in the status of Britain's railways. The British Hotel developed along parallel tracks to the British Railway. Before the train, Britons travelled by coach, and a network of coaching inns serviced the needs of passengers. They were a bit like little chefs, but with tankards of ale and none of those maple syrup pancakes. As the horse-drawn coach gave way to the steam-driven type, the need grew for somewhere to put up all the people who disembarked at the new railway termini. The hotels created were the biggest Britain had ever seen, though the earliest were rather plain and basic. The Midland Railway Company took a rather different tack. This creature behind me is their company logo, a wyvern. It was the Midlands mascot, like the Lloyds Bank horse or Melvin the Post Office spider. Like a modern corporation, they were into branding and they treated hotels as an extension of their brand. So they raised eye-catching buildings. They were well appointed, they were expensive and they weren't particularly profitable. But the railway market was incredibly competitive. So even if the hotel made a loss, the company thought the kudos it brought their railways was worth it. The best known of these was probably the St Pancras Hotel in London, but wyverns could also be found at stations and hotels from Liverpool to Bradford. So where's the railway station near the Midland Manchester? Well, these days you're more likely to encounter Bono in this building than the 933 to Knutsford, but this used to be Manchester's central station. The trains were permanently diverted to Piccadilly Station in 1968. The building spent years as a car park before becoming GMEX, home to trade shows and gigs. That's why, in recent years, the Midland has welcomed superstars like Robbie Williams, Justin Timberlake and Krista Burr. When they strutted from the stage, they didn't have too far to walk to their hotel suites, assuming, of course, they didn't have someone to do their walking for them. Manchester didn't get its own Midland Hotel until 1903, later than other big northern cities. It was worth the wait. The copywriters claimed it was the best hotel in the world, in which guests might experience the perfecting of civilization. The architects did their best to live up to the hype. They created a self-contained city. There were four different places to eat, including a French restaurant and an American grill. There was a phone in every bedroom. The hotel had its own post office, even its own theatre. The handful of original interiors to survive today offer a sense of how magnificent the place must have been. The coffee room would have put Starbucks to shame. And this was the men's reading room. 
the women had their own. Imagine it full of Edwardians poring over their copies of the Manchester Guardian and their favourite Elizabeth Gaskell. The building was a source of civic pride, a symbol of the power of the railways, of engineering, of industry, of Manchester, and yet there was self-hatred mixed in with all this swagger. An advert for the hotel in the Times of 1906 certainly talked up the building's facilities, but they dissed its host city something horrible. It is in Manchester, but not of Manchester. The ads offer up the hotel as a kind of hermetically sealed pod that will protect you from all the Mancunian awfulness beyond its doors. Such self-containment of an hotel would be unnecessary in any city but Manchester, whose unlovely climatic conditions, though almost proudly admired by its loyal citizens, are apt to terrify all those who are called upon to endure them for the first time. Well, any meteorologist will tell you that Plymouth is in fact Britain's rainiest city. OK, so Manchester in 1906 wasn't the city of today. The mills then were dark and satanic, not she-she loft conversions full of management consultants and graphic designers. But they'd anticipated the problems of industrial pollution at the Midland. The terracotta tiling that covers the building is particularly good at resisting acid rain and soot. And to keep out what the ads called the damp, smoke-laden, impure air of Manchester, the Midland Hotel Group made use of a new technology they had introduced to Britain – revolving doors. Actually, I suspect that all this emphasis on asphyxia and bad smells is just pandering to the prejudices of southern visitors. Clearly, many of the Midlands guests didn't feel that they were taking their lives in their hands by venturing outside without breathing apparatus, otherwise they wouldn't have had so many parties up here. Roof gardens were a hit in the early years of the hotel. Rooftop recreation areas might have been a familiar idea for those guests who'd been on an alpine skiing holiday. An orchestra once played up here among the chimney pots, and wedding parties were held on the boardwalk. One grand do was for the daughter of Marx, as in Anne Spencer, though Daddy didn't do nibbles in those days, unfortunately. Another beautiful relationship was inaugurated back on the ground floor. On the 4th of May 1904, Charles Stuart Rolls met Frederick Henry Royce for lunch at the Midland. Their back-of-the-napkin idea grew into one of the most potent status symbols of the 20th century, the engineering equivalent of flashing a wad of 50s. But it wasn't just the baby motor industry that power lunched at the Midland. British capitalism was at its biggest and fattest, and this is where its beneficiaries came for high-class swill. Cotton tycoons regularly hosted lavish lunches. This gal represents the colonies, offering their natural resources as a tribute to Britannia. And though slavery had officially been abolished decades before, you can't help wondering about the pay and conditions of the black workers who were doing all the graft. It's a reminder that some of the wealth that the Midland represents came from exploiting people who lived a long way from Oxford Road. There's a certain kind of honesty about it. It's a bit like buying a pair of Nike trainers in a box bearing a picture of the Indonesian workers who stitch them together. Within a few years, though, Britain's trading might and the prosperity on which the Midland had been built was threatened by the outbreak of war. The First World War had a dramatic effect on one particular part of the hotel and the people who worked there. The Midlands' original customers wouldn't have been interested in this gym. Bodybuilding was still a specialist interest at the turn of the last century. Russian and Turkish baths were more common Edwardian recreation. But underneath the paintwork here, you can see that this was once an ornate room. This was the hotel's very own German beer hall. Until 1914, Manchester had a big German community. The hotel's historian told me more. So, Barbara, this was the, the German restaurant, which yes. was presumably staffed by German yes. waiters. So what happened to them when the war broke out? Well, they were all interned and they went to the Isle of Man. 
and uh, there was one in particular, a young man called Hugo, who had got engaged to one of the English girls in the in the hotel, Alice, and um, so that was very sad. And uh, they wrote to each other for quite some time, and then sadly the letter stopped. And at the end of the war, she decided she'd go to Germany to find out what had happened, which I thought was very brave of her. Mm. And she f must have known his address and got there, and he'd married somebody else. Mm. Very sad. Must have happened to, to many people back then, mm, wasn't it? Yeah. But, and, and what happened to the, to, the, to the room itself, to the beer hall? Ah, well, um, what had been the German restaurant in 19, 1914 became the old English restaurant, for obvious reasons. And it's changed its name a few times. It then became the Concord Bar later on. To reflect and the Treaty of Versailles. May well be, uh, yes, one <laughs> possibly. And then um, it was the Goblet Wine Bar, and it's now where they do the aerobics. <laughs> While the restaurant kept renaming itself to keep up with European geopolitics, the staircase next door has abstained from change. These tiles have only once been covered up during the Second World War to protect them from the anticipated effects of fire and shrapnel. Yet the bombers left the Midland Hotel alone, and there's a rather irresistible urban myth that suggests why. In 1912, a young art school dropout went on a tour of the northwest of England. He liked Rochdale Town Hall. He liked the Midland Hotel. He liked his buildings bold and with plenty of Lebensraum. And his name was Adolf. Later, so the story goes, after he'd gone on to bigger, though not better, things, Hitler earmarked the Midland Hotel as a perfect headquarters for the Gestapo after the successful German invasion of Britain. So he gave the Luftwaffe orders not to destroy it. Presumably, it also brought back the German restaurant. The German state never got to run the Midland, but the British state did. After the war, when the railways were nationalised, so were all the railway hotels. Today, every area of life is the subject of private interest. Even the bare-bones responsibilities of the state, things like healthcare and education and the prison system. But in the immediate post-war years, nobody seemed uncomfortable with the idea of the government controlling luxury businesses. Some of the best hotels in Britain, or in the world for that matter, were run by a division of British Rail. Not just this one, the Glen Eagles Hotel in Scotland was also part of the portfolio. Now, for somebody who grew up with all those two Ronnie's gags about British Rail coffee going up to 40p a slice, that idea is pretty hard to swallow. <laughs> The Midlands' exclusive French restaurant has remained largely unchanged for a century. Bruno, the current manager, has been here since 1969 and well remembers when fine dining was the responsibility of civil servants. They used to have 32 hotels. Therefore, they used to have a main buyer for the store as well as, as the wine. And that is the reason why they had everything a high standard. For example, this one, the Adelphi, the British Caledonian England Eagles, used to have exactly the same silver, the same standard, the same high stand than everywhere else in the company. So when you came here, you'd, you'd come from the Savoy and, and from the Paris Ritz. Was this hotel really in the same league? Absolutely. Very, very, very good hotel. He had about four restaurants. He had about 75 to 80 chefs. It was the first restaurant in Britain who have achieved a Michelin star. What were the wine cellars like? The wine cellar was, I mean, out of this world. The choice, the vintage was the best. And was it a profitable enterprise? Very. The Midland Hotel, to my experience since I've been here and I'm before, never lost money. So what happened? Why isn't this hotel still run by a railway company? They were making a lot of money for British Rail. But they, of course, after the Margaret Thatcher, which has decided that, of course, British Rail do not need hotels, then obviously everything went a bit down because they had to sell most of the hotel individually and different company bought them and of course uh, all of the bought it. Do you think they got it for a good price? They, they got it for a very good price. I am positive of it, yes. The Midland was no British Leyland that the state was sick of bailing out. Despite the good job British Transport Hotels was clearly doing, the building was still flogged off for a paltry £2 million. 
The new owners did have to commit to a major refurbishment, however. Most of the Midlands Edwardian features were long gone, replaced by the man-made fibres and white clean surfaces beloved of the 60s and 70s. Back then, it may have been the height of cool for a hotel to have a sauna lounge boasting colour television. Very joy of sex. But the Midland was becoming a bit vernacular. Theming one of your bars as a butty boat might be cute, but you can imagine the sniggers from the Savoy and the Ritz. As the Midland tried to become fashionable instead of grand, it lost its unique selling point and lost its battle to compete with its London rivals. Other big hotels opened in the city, although their architecture has now gone out of fashion just as the Midland has come back in. When Holiday Inn bought the Midland, they did resuscitate a few of its Edwardian features. But a heritage building was never an obvious match with the rest of their chain, and after an early 80s refurbishment, you sense they didn't really know what to do with the place. Years of slow decline followed, but the building still traded on the cachet of its past. It was popular with Manchester United footballers like David Beckham and pop stars like Victoria Posh Spice. That's why they chose here to consummate their relationship. In 2005, the Midland acquired some new owners. They've invested £13 million and were busy renovating the place when I visited. The latest restyling is much more sympathetic than many previous ones. The new owners want the place to become a destination again. These designs will go out of fashion as surely as Teutonic style dining and 1960s vinyl. But at least the Midland is back in the competition. Something of its old bolshiness has returned. It's again sticking at least one finger up at the idea that style is only found in London. These days, the Midlands' message of defiance is being voiced by newer buildings. The city's full of them. The Lowry, the new canal side developments, the new Piccadilly station. But the Midlands should be remembered for saying it first. Manchester 4, London 0. Result.